Okay, how did the universe begin? I have no idea. I look old, but I'm not that old. Actually, I'll tell you how the universe began. There were subatomic particles and some gases. And when the subatomic particles collided with the gases, there was this huge explosion, incredible heat. And from there, it all began. Now, I know you don't accept that as a good answer. And you didn't expect me to say that. Because you know that you can't start with two things. So if I'm going to explain how the universe began, it doesn't make any sense to say there were two things. There were these two guys, and they were <laughs> like who invented sushi. Two Jewish guys who wanted to open a restaurant but couldn't afford a kitchen. How do, you, how do you start with two? Okay, in the beginning, there were subatomic particles and there were gases, but which of the two came first? Then I know how it began. So imagine if we say, first, there were only subatomic particles. They were eternal, they just exist. And then, that's it, that's the end of the story. <laughs> if there's only one thing that exists, nothing will ever change. How could it? And that's why in the theory, you have to start with two things so that you have a catalyst, you can have an explosion, something can happen when they collide. But imagine there's only one thing. And then, and then there's only one thing. It's the end of the story. Now, in Torah, in different places, we are given different um, reasons for creation. We're not told how it happened, but we are told why it happened. In fact, on the first word of the Torah, Bereshis, the first comment from the Medrash is for the purpose of Torah, which is called Reshis, and for the purpose of Jews who are called Reshis. So what is the first comment that the Medrash feels necessary? Not to explain how God created, because that's none of our business. But why? That we need to know. We need to know why we're here. So we need to know why he created the world. And there are a number of given reasons. For example, God is a king, and a king needs subjects. you got to be a king over somebody. Now this is true once God took on the role of a king, it does not explain why he created the world in the first place. So that comes later in creation when God gets to the attribute of Malchut, which is the tenth attribute. Then he needs someone to be king over. But why does he need to be king at all? Which means royalty is one of the creations. So it doesn't explain why he created, it's telling you what he created. And the same is true with kindness. One of the reasons given for creating the world is that God is kind, and the kind need to do kindness. So he created the world to do kindness. Now, the obvious question, <laughs> objection to that explanation is, God created us as a favor? This is a favor? If you really want to do me a favor, then do me a favor and don't create me, and I'll never complain. 
But here we have the same problem as with royalty. According to Kabbalah, God created kindness on the first day of creation. So if he created chesed, if he created kindness on the first day of creation, then how can kindness be the motivation for the creation? He created kindness out of kindness? So the al Tadebbe gives us the answer from a medrash and says this really explains the origins of the universe. The origins of the universe is God's desire. God desires a dwelling place in the lowest world. Now that makes perfect sense. Because if there was only one thing existing, where would change come from? It would have to be internally generated. It can't be the collision of two separate entities. So since there was only God, what caused a change that resulted in the, in the universe? An internal combustion God desired. <clears throat> the problem with understanding the origins of the universe is that for all practical purposes, the, u the universe began as a zero. How do you go from zero to something? How do you go from not to yes? I understand you can go from one to 60. But from zero, how do, you, how do you get out of the zero zone when you have nothing? So the trick to understanding the universe is don't start with something and then enlarge it. You've got to explain how we go from nothing to something. That's why the best explanation is God has a desire. Now to understand that a little better, what does God desire? If nothing exists, what is there to desire? You know, you never take your kids to a toy store. That's rule 102 in child raising. Never take your kid to a toy store. I take my kids to a toy store and we walk in and within seconds they notice something on the top shelf. <laughs> I, say, I, I need one of those. So I said, oh, that's so sad. If you had told me when we left the house that you need one of those, I would have brought money. But I didn't need, I didn't know you needed one of those. So I didn't bring any money. Why didn't you tell me when we left the house that you needed one of those? The answer is because you don't need one of those. You're not even sure what one of those is. So what does he mean when he says, I need one of those? I developed a desire for one of those. No, you didn't. If you really had a desire for one of those, you would have told me in the house. Now, when you walk into the store, one of those chooses you. You didn't choose it. It reached out and grabbed you. So you don't need it. It needs you. In other words, the child's desire was produced by the object only after he saw it. How could a child need a toy that he never saw? <laughs> Make it even, even more difficult. How can a child desire a toy that doesn't yet exist? He can't. 
So when we say God desired a dwelling place in the lower world, it means the desire is generated by himself, from himself, within himself, not inspired by anything besides him. This is called absolute desire or essential desire or pure desire. Pure meaning no artificial ingredients. Or to put it in simple terms, this is him. This is him. So let me introduce you to God. This is the God who desires a dwelling place in the lower world. And that desire is infinite as he is infinite. It's eternal as he is eternal. It's him. Because there was nothing else. It was just him. So on the one hand, we say, God chose willingly to create the world. But at the same time, this is him. So he couldn't not choose it. So was it a free choice? Or was, it, was he compelled? That's a little difficult. He compels himself to make that choice. Because nothing else can compel it. Because nothing else exists. So to say something compelled him, no, there was nothing. But can he do otherwise? No, this is him. This is him. So yes, it is voluntary, but no, it is not affected by anything outside of him. So this is him. To make this concept really beautiful, if we were try to understand what is it that God is after? What did he create the world for? You'll be surprised by the answer. What did he create the world for? If you say kindness, that's not good. If you say royalty, no, that can't be. If you say to do us a favor, no thanks. The correct answer is, what did God create the world for? Nothing. God created the world for someone, not for something. Because he's missing nothing. What he wanted, what he desires, is to have someone beside him. So what was missing before God created the world? He was everywhere. He was everything. He was infinite. He was eternal. He was perfect. And being perfect, how could he need anything? Right? Wasn't that the question? If he's perfect, how could he need anything? The answer is he doesn't need anything. He needs someone. Why? <laughs> I just told you. There was only him. See, we say it like it's a big compliment. Do you know that God existed before anything else and there was just him? What, is that impressive? Is that a talent? <laughs> is that part of God's greatness? No, it's telling you what was missing. There was just him. Yeah, and he's perfect. Right. Right. And there's just him. What changed when God created the world? Now there's us. Now he has us. So what did he gain? No, not a what. Who did he gain? Now what is the difference between wanting something or wanting someone? If I want something... I'm not perfect. 
Because if I want something and I can't get it, then, then there's something lacking in me. But what if I want you? I just want you. I don't want to be the only thing in existence. I want you to exist also. And you don't exist. What am I missing? I want you to be in my life and you're not there. What am I missing? You get married. We'll talk about this. We'll talk about this uh, tomorrow or the day after. You get married. You don't marry something. You marry someone. What are you missing before you marry someone? Companionship? No, that's a something. A tax deduction? <laughs> that's a something. What are you missing before you have him? Or before you have her? The answer is, you're missing her. So if God can't have us, if we refuse him, we don't want to be his people, what will he be missing? Nothing. It's not a what, it's a who. He will be missing, uh, we will be missing. So how does that make him imperfect? It doesn't. It makes him perfect and humble. Because being himself was not enough. How humble is that? You're perfect, you're omnipotent, you're eternal, and it's not enough. Well, what more do you want? Not more. Can't be more. When you're infinite, you can't be more. So, what does he want? No. Who does he want? So, the creation of the world meant creating someone with whom he can have a relationship. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic and you're looking for more information or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it. These ideas, these messages, this approach to life, this approach to Torah, to meaning, and to morals is vital for the world today. And we need to get this message out to the entire world. It is universal. It's essential. It's indispensable. To support this effort, if you want to be a partner in this crime, check out the link and make a donation. It really helps a lot. And thank you in advance.